All right, so this is a continuation of what we discussed on Monday. All right, so there are three things that are uh, important in our current topic. And <clears throat> I'm using my home setup here, so it's a little bit clunky compared to the school setup, but it should work the same. So there are three things that, that are in place here. One is resolution. Okay, there we go. So one is resolution. And what resolution is, is um, when you have two conjunctions in excuse me, when you have two disjunctions in that are connected by a conjunction and it fits the format of uh, you have some kind of psi <coughs> or phi and then and this is an and this is not phi or rho then that implies psi or rho so this is resolution, and resolution is nice because every time you apply resolution, you lose one variable. In this case, we lose the variable phi. So that means, you know, when this, unlike the other transformations that we have talked about, this one um, always you know, reduces the number of variables in the resulting expression. <coughs> but you can also see that this works best when we have a conjunction of a bunch of stuff okay because you can see how there's a conjunction here and then on each side of the conjunction are two disjunctions so we would like to express everything as a conjunction of disjunctions that is cnf oops oh i click on the wrong key earlier okay so that's cnf conjunctive normal form where you have one single conjunction of many disjunctions and each disjunction can only have variables or the negation of variables or you know, constants for that matter <coughs> now when you do resolution uh, the you know, simplest form of simplest form of resolution goes like this okay you can have p or false and not p or false so in this case, when you apply resolution, the P goes away, and so you only have false or false left. But false or, false or false is just false. So that means you know, if we keep applying resolution, um, we may get to the point where uh, we get false. So and as, res as a result, you know, that means um, you can use proof by contradiction. So the next item here is proof by contradiction. So the way proof by contradiction works is if you originally have some kind of psi implies some kind of phi, <coughs> meaning the phi is a theorem of psi. Okay, so we'll say phi is a theorem of psi then we also can prove the theorem by saying if I use psi and I have a conjunction with the negation of phi then that should be zero so if this is one okay if uh, psi implies phi is true then the conjunction between psi and not phi should be false so this is basically proof by contradiction <coughs> and the way this works is uh, we start with psi and then we convert it into a CNF and then we start with not phi and convert it also into a CNF and then we perform resolution um, you know, until one of two things happens until one the resolution cannot uh, work anymore any further or you know, we can get to the point where um, we get a false then the whole thing is proven to be uh, the theorem is now proven to be a theorem of psi if we get to a false when we get to a contradiction <coughs> all right so with that said uh, the next thing we'll do 
is to take a look at the homework assignment and kind of get to the answers of both the relations homework assignment and also the uh, CNF homework assignment. Because the CNF homework assignment is the uh, basis of the next um, homework assignment. All right, so we get back to relations first. Okay, so here's the relations homework assignment. It is due at 3 p.m. today. And so we'll take a look at that. All right, so question number one, consider the not equal to relation over all integers. Which of the following relation property applies? <coughs> all right, it is not reflexive because a number cannot be uh, not equal to itself, so it's not reflexive. Uh, it is also not transitive because when one does not equal to two and two does not equal to one, but one does equal to one, or I can say it is not the case that one does not equal to one, so it's not transitive. It is also not anti-symmetric because um, one does not equal to two, two does not equal to one, but one does not equal to one. E Let's see. What am I saying here? <laughs> um, okay, it is not anti-symmetric because uh, 1 does not equal to 2, 2 does not equal to 1, and 1 and 2 are not the same. There we go. Um, it is therefore not partially ordered, and therefore it is not totally ordered, but it is symmetric. So this is the only thing that you can check here. <coughs> Question number two, consider the equal to relation over all integers, which of the following <coughs> relation properties apply? We know it is reflexive because uh, each number equals to itself. It is transitive because you know, uh, the only relations, you know, the only two tuples that apply are you know, when, the two, when the, the two elements of the two tuple are the same. So it is automatically transitive. And it is also anti-symmetric because you know, when A relates to B and B relates to A, then A and B are the same. <coughs> it, it is symmetric because you know, you know, um, when one equals to one, because, because both sides are the same, so it is also automatically symmetric. So that means um, e equal, equality itself is actually partially ordered. But it is not totally ordered because um, each number does not relate to anything other than itself. <coughs> Question number three. If R and S are both relations defined over X and we know the intersection between these two is reflexive, then what do we know for sure about R? So the only thing we really can know about R is that it is reflexive. There's nothing else we can uh, specify here. But we know it has to be reflexive because the elements that are required um, to be for R to be reflexive is in the, sec in the intersection between R and S. So that means that it has to be in R itself. <coughs> Question number four. Consider the less than relation over integers which of the uh, rela following relation properties apply. Uh, we know it is not reflexive because the number is not less than itself. We know it is transitive because if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. We know it is anti-symmetric because a number cannot be, uh, A cannot be less than B and uh, A, okay, let me think about it. A cannot be less than B and B cannot be less than A. They cannot both be true. So that means you know, there's no reason for this not to be anti-symmetric. Um, it is not symmetric for sure because um, A is less than B. If A is less than B, then B cannot be less than A. So it cannot be reflexive. So it is not partially ordered because it is not reflexive and as a result cannot be totally ordered. <coughs> Question number five, consider the greater than or equal to relation over integers, which of the following relation properties apply? It is partially ordered. Okay, let, let me uh, go, go to the more basic ones first. So it is reflexive because you know, a number is less than, is, excuse me, greater than or equal to itself. 
it is transitive because if A is greater than or equal to B and B is greater than or equal to C, then A is greater than or equal to C. It is anti-symmetric because it is not symmetric to begin with. Well, <coughs> um, well, it is anti-symmetric because if A is greater than or equal to B and B is greater than or equal to A, then A and B must be the same. So as a result, it is partially ordered and it is also totally ordered because between any two integers, um, one has to be greater than or equal to, equal to the other one. <coughs> so it is uh, comparable. Um, question number six, if R is a relation defined over X is known to be reflexive, which of the following do we know for sure regardless of the actual definitions of R and X? So let's examine you know, each one and try to find out you know, what it is, what it means. Uh, the cardinality of R has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of X. Well, that sounds reasonable, okay, because you know, everything, because you have to have um, every element in X relating to itself, so the cardinality of R is greater than or equal to X, the cardinality of X, that seems to make sense. But I am not going to uh, click the answer just yet, let me check out the other ones. <coughs> The cardinality of R does not equal to the cardinality of X. No, that is not true, because we can make R just reflexive, and then it has the same number as elements as there are in X. Uh, none of the other answers can be confirmed. Well, we, we, conf we at least confirm this one. Um, it cannot be less than, the cardinality of R cannot be less than the cardinality of X, because um, we need every element in X to relate to itself, so it has to be at least equal to. But it doesn't guarantee to be equal to either because we can have other things in order for R to be something else. But you know, just because we know it is reflexive, we know that the cardinality of R is greater than or equal to the cardinality of X. So the first one is still the correct answer. Question number seven. If R is a relation defined over X, R is known to be symmetric. Which of the following do we know for sure, regardless of how, how R and X are defined. <coughs> All right, so we take a look at this, and uh, R, the, cardin <coughs> the cardinality of R is even. That is not true, <coughs> because an empty relation, well, okay, if it's an empty relation, then it is, uh, it has zero as the cardinality of R, so it is even, however, we can have a single element um, <coughs> in R, and it can still be symmetric, uh, because you know, let's say you know x has one, two, and three. R can have you know just open paren one, comma one, and close paren. That makes R um, symmetric, and you know the cardinality of R in this case is one, which is an odd number. It doesn't have to be odd either. Because as I said a little bit earlier, an empty relation which has a cardinality of zero is also um, symmetric. <coughs> um, the cardinality of R does not have to be two times the cardinality of X because we just showed it because you know, R can be empty and X can, if X, when X is not empty. The cardinality of R does not equal to the cardinality of X um, if R is just uh, reflexive, um, <coughs> then the cardinality of R and the cardinali cardinality of X would be the same, but that R would still be uh, symmetric, so this is not true either. Uh, the cardinality of R is less than the cardinality of X. That is not necessary either, uh, because you know, we can have more things in R than there are things than in X. And there are things in X, um, in and still have R to be symmetric. <coughs> it doesn't have to be greater than or equal to because we know R can be empty and X is not empty. Does not have to equal to because you know of the same reason. So the only answer that applies here is none of the other choices can be confirmed. So let's check it and submit the quiz. Um, one, 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 one. One, one. All right, so 
uh, that is all correct here. All right, so that's one. And then we are going to work on the CNF homework assignment next. All right. <coughs> so the CNF assignment is right here. And the expression that you need to convert to a CNF is this one over here. All right, so I will do that inside an editor. Okay. And then the original expression is P implies, implies R and Q. The whole thing implies not T. <coughs> so now we do some derivation. Uh, the first thing I'll do is to apply the um, definition of implication. So we have not P or R and Q um, implies not T. I'm doing this really step by step. This has to do with the definition of implication. And then at this point, I can also negate the entire first part, not P, oops, not P or R and Q, and then or, not T. This is also the application of the definition of implication. And then after this, we have, um, oop, new line. <coughs> then we have to apply the Morgan's Law, because you know, we have a negation here of a conjunction, which is here. So we apply the Morgan's Law. So the Morgan's law is going to uh, negate each component of the conjunction. This is one component. And then it will also change the um, operator from a conjunction to a disjunction. So we have this, and then uh, the whole thing, or not T. So I'm going to put in some extra parentheses, parentheses here, even though they are not really 100% necessary. So this is uh, the, the Morgan's Law. <coughs> and then at this point, we apply the Morgan's Law again, because we have this negation of this or here. So we can apply the Morgan's Law again. So that would make it uh, not not P and not R, the whole thing, or not Q, that whole thing, or not T. So once again, this is the application of the Morgan's Law, like so. And now we can look at this whole thing, and we can recognize that we have a OR over here, but it is the OR of another disjunction. So that means you know, the parentheses can be dissolved, so I can now change it to not, uh, we can do the simplification first. So not not P becomes just P not R, or not not P not R becomes just P not R, P and not R, and then or not Q or not T. <coughs> this is a simplification um, and also associative, which is uh, referring to the removal of extra parentheses that are no longer needed. And then from here, uh, it is surprisingly close already, because the next thing we do is we group these two into one single thing. So this is, once again, the associative uh, law, because you know, we can put parentheses uh, and group items you know, within a or, and you know, just kind of, instead of grouping the first two, and then we can group the second two. And now we can apply uh, distribution. So when we apply distribution, we are basically looking at this whole thing as one item, and then we distribute over the, um, the conjunction over here. <coughs> All right, so I will do it really kind of step by step here. So we are gonna um, break this up in as um, uh, P and P or not Q or not T and not R or not Q or not T. <coughs> so this is using distribution. 
and then after that we can remove the extra parentheses and sort the num uh, the letters so it's easier to kind of read later on so q is before r so we have not q or not r or not t and this is uh, basically associative <coughs> and commutative commutative there we go all right so now we have a c and f you know for uh, the original expression and your new homework assignment is going to take this okay let me show you a new homework assignment so your new homework assignment is resolution and proof by contradiction okay let me uh, move this one out, out of the way because it's really not needed anymore so now that we have the CNF from the CNF assignment being its own CNF like this, okay, yeah, which is the same as what you saw earlier. The next phase is to uh, show whether a Boolean expression is a theorem of psi, and I just basically call this one psi, <coughs> using only resolution and proof by contradiction. So the first proposed theorem phi is as follows, okay, so this is phi, and the second proposed theorem phi prime is as follows. So what I want you to do is to prove whether phi and phi prime are theorems of psi or not. <coughs> Be sure to show all steps in your answer. You may assume the reader of your answer understands Boolean algebra rules, but show all the der derivation steps in sequence. Explain the conclusion for each proposed theorem. Um, and then we have the usual same notation stuff here, um, and also the uh, operator priority. You know, these are the things that we should know already by now. All right, so that's your new homework assignment. You have another week to work on this one. Um, because you have already done the CNF assignment, so you know, the process of turning these two into a CNF you know, should not be too challenging. Um, it's basically, um, there, there are two rules you have to apply regardless of what you're dealing with. Um, you know, if you see implication, you have to apply the definition of implication. If you see a, the negation of an and or the negation of an or, you have to use De Morgan's Law. So those two are guaranteed that you have to use. And then the rest is kind of more flexible depending on um, <coughs> what your question is asking you. All right, so what I'll do next is I am going to show you um, the exam two from last semester because I'm just using some of those questions as an example of showing you how to prove uh, by contradiction using resolution and converting everything into a CNF. So let me go find that stuff, okay. <coughs> oh, I guess not. Oh, I know why it's not finding it. I need to specify the semester two. Um, Oh, right, right, okay, I see why. There we go. All right, so let's skip to a CNF question, which is... Down here. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so this one is, <coughs> excuse me, relatively easy. Um, because in an exam, you know, you may not have the time to <coughs> uh, work on all the steps, at least, you know, from last semester, I, um, I made it kind of relatively easy. So you're given, you know, what psi and what phi are already. And I'm just going to copy that to my notepad so that we can use it for um, discussion. So right now I'm just copying. <coughs> okay. All right. 
All right, so <clears throat> this is our psi. Our psi is not P or not R and not Q or not R or P or and P or Q, that's psi. And then phi itself is a negation of um, something already. So the first thing you need to do is to negate phi or you can say not phi. So not phi is just the negation of phi, what, of what phi is. So we just take this entire thing, which is phi, and negate the entire thing. And you can also see that you know, we have double negation here. But after we remove the double negation or simplify you know, the double negation, we end up with a uh, CNF already. <coughs> so now the what we need to do is to take psi, which is everything that is known to be true, and then we want to use a conjunction and you know and and it with the negation of phi, but the negation of phi is already done here. So the conjunction between psi and the negation of phi is really just you know if I were to copy and paste, um, this is psi and then uh, not phi. The negation of phi is this portion here. So now we need to apply uh, resolution. So when we apply resolution, uh, you can do it in a, in a systematic way. You can also do it in a not too systematic way. It's up to you. So the way that I usually do it you know, in a much more in a systematic way is to look at the first item here, look at the first item here, and then I ask, um, does anyone have just a P in it? And you can see that, oh, okay, you know, this one has a P in it. So these two can resolve. <coughs> but after the resolution, we end up with uh, Q. Okay, let's, let's actually do this. Okay, so we are going to work on this one. Um, okay, the best way, to, or one of the be better way to illustrate it is to separate these two. I mean, separate each... Uh, disjunction on its own line <coughs> and then we number these okay so so we call this a call oops call this b call this c d and e all right so i will start with a first so A can resolve with um, anything that has a non-negated P or anything that has a non-negated R. So there are quite a few that we can resolve here, but I'm going to start with C. So A and C resolve to, um, so the not P is gone, so we have Q or not R. <coughs> This is after we resolve A and C. Um, and then A also resolves with D. Okay. And after the resolution, we have not P the only is the only thing left. So this is after the A D resolution. And then it also resolves with nope, that's yeah, it does resolve with uh, the next one too, which is a not Q or R, and then after that resolution, we have not P or not Q. <coughs> so this is after A and E resolve. Let me double check. Yep, because we're using R as the connection, so that's how that's what we end up with in uh, AE after we resolve A and after we use A and E to resolve. Yep, okay. So now we have done everything that we can use A for, we move on to B. And then we ask, okay, who can resolve with B? Uh, B, C can resolve because you know, the one has not Q, the other one has Q in it. So we have P or not R you know, as the uh, result of those two resolutions. So that's a B, C. <coughs> okay, what about P and B and D? B and D can resolve because one has not R, the other one has R. 
So after that resolution, we have not P or not Q again, but that's already in here. So that means that we do not uh, need to write it down because not P or not Q is already here as the result of the resolution of A and E. So that, that means that when, even though B and D can also resolve to exactly the same thing, we don't need to you know, denote it here because it's the same result. So B and E can also resolve, and then this time we have uh, Q or uh, not Q or Q left, okay, which is a one, and that is not useful. So we basically do not need to write that down either. Okay, now if you want me to write here, I can kind of sort of tell you what it means. So when we resolve B and E, okay, this is B. The R is gone because you know that is the variable where it is negated on one side but not negated on the other side. But what we have left is just not Q. Oh, okay, never mind. It's just not Q left, not not, not, not <coughs> without the or Q. I misread. So because I misread the, the next row here. Okay. Alright. So at this point, I think most of you probably already have an idea of, oh, so that means if we can somehow end up with just P or just Q, then we would be done. So you're absolutely correct about that. So if you want to resolve to just Q or just P, you're non negated. What you need to do is to look for Q, okay, look for anything that has P in it, like this one, and now you look for P or not Q. So P or not Q is not in here, so we cannot do it that way. Um, or you can use your Q and then ask you, does anyone have Q or R? So Q or R is also not here. So we cannot you know, just do a shortcut yet at this point. So now we focus on uh, starting with C and we look for either not P or a not Q in it. <coughs> So we can see how C and D can resolve to just you know, Q or R. Q or R is the result of resolving C, D. Um, and then between C and E, that can also resolve. Okay, I'm just double checking. Between C, D, we have Q or R between C and E, then we have P or R. Now, I think I might have forgotten to kind of continue to move on you know, with, uh, after B, E. Um, I think I, there are more things that can resolve between B and the derived ones. So between B and AC, we can resolve to just a not R. Okay, so not R is the result of applying B to uh, what we know as AC, this one here. So if you look at B, it has not Q or not R. And then when you look at AC, it has Q or not R. So we use Q you know, for the resolution you know, as the connection. And then we have left, we are only left with not R, which is helpful. And then, you know, and so on. We can look for B and AD and see if they resolve. Nope, they do not. Um, B and AE, they do not resolve. <coughs> and then B and BC, we do not have to look because you know, those are all generated by B. So, you know, we do not have to look at those. All right. All right, so we have another hope here, which is you know, to look for something that can resolve to just R. So if you want to resolve to just R, you're looking for, um, we are looking for P or R. Yep, okay, so that will work. So I'm going to kind of just, you know, skip to, um, R here, which is the result of resolving D, which has not P or R, 
And now I just need to look, to look for something that has Q or R, which is CD. So you can see how D here is uh, not P or R. And then we can also see how CD, oh, okay, um, I think we are talking about E, not that, okay. So we're talking about E and CD. So this is E, it has not Q or R. And then we have CD, which is just Q or R. So the Q and the not Q are canceled out, and we have only R left. But now you can also see how we can resolve to false by uh, looking at BAC and ECD, because those two, BAC is uh, just not R itself, and then ECD is just R itself. So when, the, when these two resolve, then it becomes empty, which is basically just false. <coughs> so now we can say since um, psi and not phi, resolves to false, um, psi is a theorem of psi. There you go. All right, so I hope this helps with uh, you doing your homework assignment. Um, you know, you do not have to do it in a systematic like, way like the way that I did. I basically stop being systematic once I get to um, know that there's a not R here because, you know, we have, um, because in this case, you know, I can just look for R, and if there are no R's, then I can just you know, see if I can make, <coughs> uh, make R happen. And that turned out to be fairly easy, because you know, when we have E and CD, then those two can resolve to just R, and then when we have R and not R, those two resolve to you know, false, and we are done with that. <coughs> All right, so uh, we are, so hopefully this is going to be helpful, you know, for, you know, for you to do your homework assignment, um, because, you know, that's what your homework assignment needs to do. Uh, it's a little bit more involved in your homework assignment, because in your homework assignment, uh, you also have to convert, um, yes, uh, you have to convert each one of these, you, know, you have to convert to phi in this case. Um, or let me take it back. You have to convert not phi <coughs> into a CNF. You also have to convert not phi prime into a CNF before you can concatenate the psi CNF and the negated theorem you know, CNFs. And then you apply resolution to see whether you can resolve to um, a false in that case. All right. So this kind of concludes you know, the entire um, discussion of propositional logic. Even though it is kind of long as a module, uh, the essence is this part here. The essence is you know, what we just talked about here and also demonstrated you know, over here, which is you know, the way, a way, this is a way of, <coughs> of proving theorems. The most difficult part of proof of these things has to do with um, converting from a expression, a general Boolean expression, to a CNF. Um, so that is the more difficult part, you know, to uh, to work out in this case. All right. So now that we are done with uh, resolution, we can continue to talk about some additional topics. So the additional topic that I, that we are gonna talk about, you know, just following the order here, is discrete probability. So discrete probability has to do with, um, the pro it, it, it has to do with the calculation of probability, and the difference between this and most statistics classes is we are dealing with discrete you know, probability. I can give you a few examples of you know, what is discrete probability. <coughs> the chances of winning um, the jackpot of a lotto is disc discrete probability. Um, the chances of a coin flipping up you know, four times out of six is also discrete probability. So we will start with um, this 
node here called county. <coughs> and basically it is it starts with just a bunch of terms, but it would also go to the point where it gets a little bit mathematical. So we'll start with terms first. Um, a trial is a single attempt to do something, typically typically involving choosing something. A single choice is a trial. So a trial is like uh, flipping a coin is a trial because it is a single attempt to do something. It has uh, some outcomes. <coughs> um, or you know, if you have a bag of marbles, you know, picking one, you know, just randomly picking a marble out of the out of the bag is also a trial. So a trial is just you know doing one. Um, you know, if I were to use the word, you know, one, do one action that has um, outcomes associated with it, which is what the next paragraph talks about. A trial has a set of possible outcomes associated with it. So in the case of flipping a coin, the coin can land on the head or it can land on the tail. In the case of you know, choosing a marble or picking a marble out of a bag, then you know, all the marbles that are currently in the bag are possibilities. So each one is representing a, an outcome. Um, I'll give you a more concrete <coughs> example. Let's say you have a bag of marbles, and uh, the marbles, there are three marbles, uh, red, green, and blue. And the action, the trial, is to pick one marble out of the bag. So in this case, the set of outcomes associated with this trial would be red, green, and blue. There are three possible outcomes from this trial. So the next term is an experiment. An experiment is a sequence or a series of trials where subsequent trials may be affected by earlier ones, and an experiment has its own outcomes. <coughs> um, I'll give you two examples. The first one is uh, coin flipping. If you take one coin and then you flip it five times, then you have a bunch of your possible outcomes. Um, one outcome is head, 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 head. One outcome is head, 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 tail. And then another outcome is head, 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 tail, head, and so on. On the other hand, if you are choosing a marble out of a bag, like our, we have three marbles, red, green, and blue in the bag, then you can choose you know, potentially a red one followed by a blue one. You can choose a red one followed by a green one. You can have a green one followed by a red one, a green one followed by a blue one, or a blue one followed by a green one, or a blue one followed by a red one. So those are the six possible outcomes from the perspective of the entire experiment. And the entire experiment is to choose, is to pick two marbles out of the bag. <coughs> In general, the outcome set of an experiment is represented by a omega symbol, not to be confused with the set of operators in propositional calculus. So, yes, so <coughs> we do tend to reuse you know, symbols between uh, topics in, uh, in this particular class. So in this context, omega is representing the set of outcomes from the perspective of an entire experiment. And then we have general counting. Generally speaking, we are counting the outcomes of an experiment. For example, in the case of lottery, we are counting the number of unique lottery tickets. So now the question is, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, there are a few things that we need to kind of take into consideration. Um, the first one is we cannot make the assumption that uh, the set of outcomes would be the same for each trial. So we use this particular symbol here, T of i, to represent the outcome set of trial i, where i is zero oriented. <coughs> so in the case where T of i does not influence T of i j, the T of j where j is greater than i, which basically means you know, an earlier trial does not impact the uh, possible outcomes for a later trial, then the outcome set <coughs> of an experiment is basically just a Cartesian product of every single uh, trial, because in this case, you know, um, 
T1 does not, is not influenced by T0, T2 is not influenced by T0 or T1. So this is a pretty easy way to look at the outcome set of the entire experiment. Or you can look at this entire Cartesian product as omega, because you know, that's basically what it is, is it is it's the set of all the possible outcomes from the perspective of an experiment. Um, so you can also, you know, when you when we look at just the cardinality of omega, then we can look at it like this. This pi symbol here is almost the same as a sigma uh, notation, but instead of adding, we are multiplying, you know, every item as we go through the loop. <coughs> All right, so uh, maybe it's helpful to kind of go through a few examples of you know how we do counting. One of my favorite topic is the lotto game. So we, we can go to um, Powerball uh, Lotto, okay? Because we want to look up the rules, okay? And figure out your, uh, your probabilities of various things. And we can look at um, how to play because it's important to understand the rules. So Powerball, each ticket costs $2 per play, and depending on you know, where you are, blah, 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 blah. And then we can, uh, the most important part is um, how, to, how many numbers that we have to choose from. So where to play, winning numbers, mm, right there. So here, this is the, the rule. Select five numbers between between one and sixty nine for the white balls. Then select one number between one and twenty six for the red power ball. <coughs> and choose your numbers on the play slip or let the lotto terminal randomly pick your numbers. So what it does not say, which is actually quite important, is the five numbers that you choose between one and sixty nine for the white balls. is that you're not supposed to repeat the same number. So you should not be choosing one, 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 one. <coughs> so there are, there are five unique numbers between one and 69. Also, you know, what they also do not specify here is the ordering is not important. Um, you, can you can choose your number as one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. They're considered the same. Okay, so this, this, part, this part is also very important, is that the ordering is not important as you choose those five numbers, and these five numbers have to be unique. Um, then select one number between one and 26 for the red power ball. Also, they did not specify that this part here has nothing to do with the earlier part, which means you know, whatever number you have chosen for the white balls does not impact you know, what numbers are available for the red power ball. Okay, so that is uh, enough information for us to figure out you know, the number of <coughs> possible tickets. And the way we look at the number of possible tickets, the best way to do it is to use a tree to represent it. All right. Um, okay. So before we can um, demonstrate that, okay, the first thing we need to do is to say is um, to choose five things from 69 is not an easy thing to show. So instead of doing that, I'm going to show you how to choose four things of two things out of four things. Okay, so I'm going to write down here how to choose two things out of four. Oops. where <coughs> ordering is not important. Okay, and the way we look at this is look at it from the a tree perspective. So we have items, items, A, B, C, and D. So when you begin, as you choose the first item, there are four possibilities, right? You can choose A, or B, or C, or D. 
And then after you have chosen A, you can choose three more items. You'll put the second item. So A cannot be used again. Okay, so choose two unique things out of four. So once A is already chosen, this looks like a Q, doesn't it? <coughs> All right, we'll fix that and turn it back into a properly written A, like so. So once A is chosen, because we need items to be unique, so that means you, know, you can only choose B, C, or D over here. Once you have chosen B, you can only choose A, C, or D over here. Once you have chosen C, you can only choose A, B, or D over here. And then once you have chosen D, you can only choose A, B, or C. So now when you look at the leaf node of the entire tree, we have A, B, A, C, A, D, uh, B, A, B, C, B, D, C, A, C, B, C, D, and then we have D, A, B, B, and B, C. Okay, so it looks like there are <coughs> um, 12 ways, you know, because you know, 4 times 3 is 12. But it's not, that is not the case, because we want to specify that ordering is not important. So we can see how, you know, AB is here, but AB is also here. So these two are duplications of each other. Um, AC and CA are duplications of each other. AD and DA are duplications of each other. BC and CB are duplications of each other. BD and DB are duplications of each other. And then CD and DC are also duplications of each other. <coughs> so the question now is, how do we know how many ways there are you know, to duplicate? So let's move on to the next slide here. Okay. So how many duplications when ordering is not important? So we have just you know, seen that in with two items, there are two ways to duplicate. So what about three items? What about four items and so on? So let's think about four items and we, we, we want to, three items, okay, three items and we'll evaluate how many ways we can generate duplicate items, okay? So we look at uh, three items, okay? Three items, how many ways to duplicate when ordering is not important. Okay, so we're going to so use a P, Q, and R in this case. <coughs> All right, so we have P, Q, R. The first item, we can choose P, Q, or R. And then for the second item, we can choose Oh, okay, never mind, because there are only two choices here, right? Um, I'm trying to make it as even as possible. Okay. All right, so once we have chosen P, the second item can only be Q or R. Once we have chosen Q, the first item can only be a P or a R. Once we have chosen R, the next item can only be a P or a Q. <coughs> And then we have to choose the third item, right? But the third item, there's really not a whole lot of choices anymore because once we have chosen P and Q, the third item has to be R. And once we have chosen P and R, then the third item has to be a Q. This also has to be R. This has to be a P. This has to be a Q. This has to be a P, like so. So there's six ways to do it because you know, out of three items, the first choice, there are three choices. The second choice after the first one is chosen, 
there are only two choices. And then for the third one, because we have chosen two out of three things already, so the third one always has one single item. So from the perspective of counting the number of leaf nodes, then we are multiplying these because you know, there are for each branch, okay, let me use the mouse here. So for each branch out at the first level, it has two branches to the, at the second level. So that's why we have a multiplication. <coughs> now, from the second branch to the third branch, or the third, second to the third level, even though you know, there's only one branch here, it is still a multiplication. So it's important to remember this is a multiplication here. So I think, you know, hopefully this is convincing you um, that given n items, there are n factorial ways to arrange them. <coughs> All right. So how does that have anything to do with our earlier problem? Okay, so let's take a look at the law two problem. So this is getting back to the law two problem. Okay, so the law two problem is to choose six uh, to choose five items is to choose five numbers out oops okay I keep forgetting that I I changed the eraser to be a lasso eraser so it is to choose five numbers out of 69 okay so if ordering is important oops Then there are <coughs> 69 times 68 times 67 times 66 times 65 ways <coughs> excuse, excuse me, good thing we are not in class, in person. So there are this number of ways, you know, if world ordering is important, because what this means is, you know, the first number can be one, two, three, four, all the way up to sixty-nine, but the second number, if you chose one, excuse me, if you chose two as your first number, the second number out of the sixty-eight can be one. So that means the ordering is <clears throat> significant when we count it like this. Okay. But if ordering is not important, then how many duplications do we have? So the way we think about, about you know, the number of duplications is if I have chosen you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 <coughs> as the five numbers, how many ways can I rearrange 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? In other words, how I can rearrange it as one, two, three, five, four. I can then rearrange it as one, two, five, three, four, and we can rearrange it as five, four, three, two, one, and so on. So how many ways can we rearrange the same five numbers <coughs> as a sequence? So from the previous slide, we know that there are there are five factorial ways to arrange five items. So that means we now are looking at 69 times 68 times 67 times 66 times 65. The whole thing divided by five factorial base. <coughs> so there are this many ways uh, of choosing Five out of sixty-nine, <clears throat> where ordering 
is not important. But then there's also the extra Powerball number, but the Powerball number is not related at all to how you choose the first five balls. So that means um, <coughs> the actual total amount. So I'm going to use the lasso tool here because I don't want to, I don't feel like you're writing this whole thing again. So copy and paste and then just move it down here. Okay, go back to my pen tool. So we have to remember to multiply this to the number of Powerball numbers, which I think is 26. So these are, this is the, <clears throat> the number of unique Powerball lotto tickets. which turns out to be about three, uh, close to 300 million, which is a, a pretty big number. Okay, so now the next question is, um, that is kind of, <coughs> um, it's not a very easy way to write this. So the question is, how can I rewrite you know, this number here as something that is a little bit easier to understand? So we can say, this is 69 factorial, divided by 5 factorial, but then somebody is going to say, but it's not even close to five, you know, uh, 69 factorial because 69 factorial is going to be 69 times 66, 68 times 67 times 66 times 65 times 64 times 63 all the way down to 1. It's, it's missing here. That whole thing is, is missing here. Well, did you notice that we can also say divided by 64 factorial? Then we get you know, this portion here, 69 times 68 times 67 times 66 times 65, because 64 factorial is the, uh, the portion that is quote unquote missing here. So if I want to start with 69 factorial, and because it's just a whole lot easier to write compared to this one here, I can just say 69 factorial divided by 64 factorial will get me the denominator, uh, the numerator here. And then the original denominator, uh, 5 factorial, has to stay here. So this is, the, this is also known as, <coughs> there are two ways to say this. Uh, now we're introducing the concept of um, combination. So this is you know, the way that we choose uh, from 69 items, we want to choose 5 in a combination. So a combination is a way of choosing something where ordering is not important. So if you say ordering is important, then we have 69 factorial divided by 64 factorial. That is, all, that is called the permutation of choosing 69 things. Six, uh, excuse me, I take, I take it back. This is choosing five things out of 69 things where ordering is important. So this one is ordering is not important. This one is when ordering is important. All right. So in general, okay, so in general, if you have n items of which you want to choose r and ordering is not important, then you have n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, and also in the denominator, you also have to include um, r factorial <coughs> over here because you, know, you want to um, remove the duplicates. Then in terms of permutation, you have n items to start with, and you have r items you know, to, that you want to choose from, then you have n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, by, you know, and just that, because you don't want to uh, eliminate um, the same r items, but arrange differently, and that's why with this one, you do not divide it by r factorial. So this is combination, and this is permutation. 
Now this is also sometimes you know, people write it as and choose R. That's one way to specify and choose R. Um, and then on the spreadsheet, if you're interested in doing your calculation on a spreadsheet, this is known as combin. Okay, so in the spreadsheet, you specify combin, and then you specify how many items you start with, how many items you want to choose from, no, how many items you want to end up in your in chosen. Then R is the number of items being chosen, or N is out of how many to begin with. This one is per mut, P U M U T, and same thing, N and R. So these are the spreadsheet functions if you want to use a spreadsheet to do all these calculations. <coughs> these are pretty important concepts. Um, there are a lot of um, discrete probability topics are based on um, these ideas, you know, permutation and also combination. <coughs> Let's work out another you know, fun uh, example here. Uh, this one has to do with the number, what are the chances that out of an entire class, no one shares the same uh, birth date, birth date, okay? So this question, this is called also called the birth date problem, okay? So we'll use concrete numbers, you know, because concrete numbers, you'll know, make it a little bit easier to visualize and to reason out. So we're going to say, you know, this class or this group of people, there are only three of them. So we have three people, and we want to ask uh, the chances that all three have unique birth dates. Okay. All right, so we are looking at the chances this time <clears throat> out of three people. And because you know, we, we are trying to look at the chances that these three people, they all have quote-unquote unique birth dates. So we are looking at either combination or permutation. So now the question is, is it combination or is it permutation? So there are a few ways to look at this, okay? But you have to look at omega first. So omega is the uh, outcome set, right? This is the set of all possible outcomes, which include everything that we are interested in, where all three people have unique birth dates, but also include your know, things that we are not interested in, including you know, two out of the three people have the same birth date, or all three have the same birth date. So in this case, you know, um, uh, big omega, or uppercase omega, is going to be, um, <coughs> it's going to be the set of each day in a year, okay, I'm just going to number each day as one, two, three, four, you know, in the year, and I'm going to use the dot dot notation as a range for uh, integers, so one, two, three, sixty-five, Cartesian product with one, two, three, sixty-five, Cartesian product with 1 to 365. This is our omega. So if you look at the cardinality of omega, it is just your know, 365 to the power of 3 because you know, the first set has 365 items. So when you Cartesian product this with the next one, then you have 365 squared. When you have another Cartesian product with the same set, then you have 365 uh, cubed over here. Okay, so that's omega. You know, this is the set of all the possible outcomes. So now we want to specify the set where, um, okay, so we want to now specify <coughs> um, we want to um, we want to count the number of ways that you can have three birth you can have birth dates of the three people being unique. That's what we want. To, that's what we want to count. So now the, the the question is: Do we want to use combination or do we want to use permutation? The answer is we have to use permutation. So let's just say that you know, we are looking at 
uh, January 1st, January 2nd, and January 3rd as the three birth dates that we are interested in. So they are counted separately because in Omega, they are represented separately. In other words, um, the tuple of one, two, three, oops, um, okay, let me do it one more time. The tuple one, two, three is an element of Omega. The element of three, two, one is also an element of Omega. The element of two, three, one is an element of Omega and so on. So that means you know, when you're looking at the probability, then you have to look at the possible, you have to count the number of ways to choose three unique birth dates where ordering is important because you know, the Omega, the outcome set is including these outcomes here. <clears throat> So that means we are looking at the, the number of permutation of choosing three out of 365 um, days in a year. All right, so this represents your P of 365.3 is, is representing the number of ways to choose uh, three unique birth dates for these people. So the probability is now, you know, this number divided by the cardinality of omega, okay? So the probability, probability that three people having unique birth dates is P365 3, the whole thing divided by 365 square, uh, cubed. So if you actually do the calculation, this number is pretty slim, uh, it's pretty high um, because you, know, you would expect you know, that out of three people, the chances of them having uh, separate, different, unique birth dates is pretty high, <coughs> and that really is the case. Um, you know, this number is close to one. Now, the um, one easy way to look to play with these numbers is to use a spreadsheet. So let me go back to the spreadsheet here. I mean, not spreadsheet, but the the browser. So you, one thing you can do is to use um, Google Drive and use uh, Google Sheets. So I'm going to go to, I uh, will put one into the shared folder here. So I'm going to create a new spreadsheet, new sheet like so. And we are just going to use column A to represent the number of people that we are concerned about. So there are three people here. And then we will use column B to calculate the probability of you know, these people have the same, that these people all have unique birth dates. So in this case, we have the number of permutation, starting with 365, choosing three of those, and divided by 365 to the power of three. As you can see, the probability is pretty high, it's 99.17958 blah 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 percent so the next number that we can choose is <coughs> this number plus one okay so out of four people what are the chances that four people all have unique birth dates so we look at this number and go like okay that's about the same you know it's uh, not different by much um, actually I, I I messed up here this is supposed to refer to this value here and then this is supposed to refer to the same value here. Okay, so we are down by you know about one percent, which is not much. But if you go all the way to like about fifty people, okay, which is not a whole lot of people because when you think about fifty versus one three hundred sixty-five, um, but we are down to point. Uh, we are down to two point two point seven basically. 
So there's a 2.2 percent of a chance that in a class of uh, okay class of 52 people, that everyone has a unique birthday. That's a pretty small chance. Um, <coughs> so this is called the birthday problem, and uh, as you can see, you know the uh, it's not intuitive because you would think that um, 52 is about um, it's less than one sixth of a year. Okay, it's less than one seventh of a year. So you would think, you know, the chances of people people um, not having the same birth date not to be this small. I mean, this is a really really small percentage um, because it's two percent. There's a two percent chance that out of fifty two people, they all have unique birth dates. That's a pretty small chance. All right. So I think I'm done with uh, today's lecture at this point. Um, so so you ju just as a reminder. Um, Monday is going to be like this, you know, where I would do, a, where I would record the lecture, um, you know, simply because um, two things can happen on Monday. One is I'm still COVID positive, which basically means I cannot, you know, I still have to isolate myself, and as a result, we are going to be having the lecture remotely. <clears throat> or two, I actually am no longer COVID positive. In which case, I will be attending a funeral, um, and that means you know, I won't be in class either. So, regardless of what happened, you know, Monday, next Monday is going to be just like this, you know, where I will have the recording done, and you guys can just watch it. All right, so I am done for now, and I will post this at 2 p.m. because I don't want to post this before the assignment is due. And um, Fortunately, I think YouTube has a way to specify when to uh, release a video, so I'm going to use that feature now. All right, have a nice weekend, and I will see you remotely, entirely remotely, next week. So, because Wednesday is the day when I have interviews, so it's going to be remote as well. <coughs> All right, see you next Monday, and have a nice weekend.